and welcome to the third and fourth angels messages. This evening we'd like to present to you the birth of the Messiah. And uh, for those that have not been uh, able to catch up, we are going to go into a little deep history. In recognizing the birth of the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Uh, as we start, I'd like to have a word of prayer with us. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Savior Yeshua, I ask for your grace and your mercy upon the hearers and the listeners and those who are present. And may this message be inspiring and more of an interpersonal relationship in regards to the birth of our Savior. In your name we pray, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Christmas. Christmas is coming. However, as we go into the history, I want to share with you a few key points. Christmas is coming is the note that is sounded throughout our world, from east to west and from north to south. With youth, those of mature age, and even the age, it is a period of general rejoicing, of great gladness. But what is Christmas? What it should demand so much attention? So much money is being spent, so much attention on Christmas, and yet, what is it calling so much attention? The 25th of December is supposed to be the day of the birth of Jesus Christ, or Yeshua Messiah and its observance has become customary and popular. But yet there is no certainty that we are keeping the veritable day of our Savior's birth. <clears throat> History gives us no certain assurance of this. The Bible does not give us the precise time. Had the Lord deemed this knowledge essential to our salvation, he would have spoken through his prophets and apostles. Keep your attention on the prophets and the apostles. This is key. That we might know all about the matter, but silence of the scriptures upon this point evidences to us that it is hidden from us the wisest purposes. I'm given two quotations here, and I'm going to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the Bible is not silent. The Bible reveals when Christ was born, his conception, the conception of John the Baptist. They were cousins. Your references in Adventist Home, page 477, which is here, which was written in 1985, May 2nd. And also the other reference is Review and Herald, December 9, 1884. However, these references here have to be acknowledged and understood. Are they correct? Is this true? When our Savior was born has been a question. When was our Savior born? The pastors say the Bible is silent on the question, or we don't know the date of his birth. However, paganism, Rome, started in the year 158 B.C., endured 666 years, and paganism ended in the year 508. Thirty years later, 30 years later, the transitioning into an apostate church in which began in the year 538 in Daniel 725, which is referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? Therefore, what about the date? Because the Catholic Church is the one that inserted the date. And what about his birth? This transition began in the year of 533, five years later, Justinian I, the last emperor of Rome, transitioned his power, seat, and authority and gave the scepter in Psalms 45, verse 6, to the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome at that time and today is, present tense, a soothsayer, is a witch, warlock, which became the Pope. Now, most Bible scholars and many everyday believers realize that December 25th is a very unlikely possibility for the Messiah's birth. The month of December is very cold in the land of Israel. Yeshua himself alluded to this fact when he said, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, Matthew 24, verse 20. Consequently, it is highly unlikely that Joseph would have taken his, very, his uh, pregnant wife, Luke 2, verse 5, on the long journey, approximately 80 miles from Nazareth to Je uh, Bethlehem, excuse me, in the dead of winter. And, of course, the shepherds would not have had their flocks in the fields by night, Luke 2, verse 8, in the dead of winter. They were housed in an enclosed shelters beginning in the late fall when the weather starts to get cold. Therefore, can we know the date, the correct date, 
of the Savior's birth so that we can observe it. However, what about one of the Almighty's appointed times that was given to us? <clears throat> what about December 25th? One of the best known festivals of ancient Rome was the uh, Saturnella, a winter festival celebrated on December 17th through the 24th because it was a time of wild merrymaking and domestic celebrations, businesses, schools, and law courts were closed so that the public could feast, dance, gamble, and generally enjoy itself to the fullest. December 25th, the birthday of Mithra, the Iranian god of light and a day devoted to the invincible sun, as well as the day after the Saturnella was adopted by the Catholic Church as Christmas. The nativity of Christ to counteract the effects of these festivals. Emphasis added. <clears throat> While December 25th is a pagan day, is it still all right for Christians to observe it? it? Has been the question. As long as we keep Christ in Christmas? Now, we're compromising if we do that. The Bible answers, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Your reference is in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. In Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 5, ye shall do no, excuse me, ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. Question, is there any place in the Bible where the Messiah's birthday is stated? What day is it and does the Bible mandate that we are to observe that day? Yes, absolutely. Number one, the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Yehovah. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, 34 to 36. And number two, it shall be a statute forever in your generations, Leviticus 23, verse 39 to 43. The day is the appointed time of tabernacles, ladies and gentlemen. And keep tabernacles in your mind, because tabernacles is not fulfilled. Keep it in your notes. But how do we know that the appointed time of tabernacles is the birth of the Messiah? Two things to consider. One, Leviticus 23, verse 41 declares that the appointed time of tabernacles is to be a statute forever. It's a statute. And celebrated in the seventh biblical month, if the appointed time of tabernacles is the birth of Messiah, and if we celebrate the feast, then we will be automatically celebrating the correct birthday of our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, whether we realize it or not. If the appointed time of tabernacles is the birth of Messiah, we should see definite indications in the New Testament of that fact. So let's go to the New Testament. D, are there any specific time references that pertain to the birth of the Messiah? Number one, there is two. Elizabeth conceived, hid herself five months, and in the sixth month, Luke 1, verse 26. And in the same chapter, exactly ten verses down, there is another which gives the same clue. Elizabeth also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her. Luke 1, verse 36. Therefore, then note three key events that proceed in rapid succession within the sixth month. And Miriam said, Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed, Luke 1, 38. Note, Miriam, which is her real name in Hebrew, not Mary. Mary came in later in time, being changed by those that were in authority. And that's another study. Note, Miriam agreed to become pregnant with the Messiah, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't some forceful manner that took place. She agreed. She was a very devout woman. Four, Miriam arose in those days and went with haste into a city of Judah. Luke 1, verse 39 and verse 40. Note, Miriam left immediately to see her cousin. Her cousin is Elizabeth. Five, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Miriam, the baby leaped in her womb, and she speak out, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Luke 1, verse 41 to 42. Therefore, we can conclude with a high degree of confidence that Miriam conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, making Messiah Yahushua six months younger than John. Or mathematically, plus six months equals the birth of Messiah. And let us continue this study because you need to look back in your Bibles in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 and other locations in the Old Testament so you can see the prophets and the prophecies that were proclaiming his birth. 
So we read in Adventist Home that apparently it is silent. Well, somebody wrote that because it wasn't Ellen White. And we had a study in regards to the book changes. So, but let us go on. Let, let us use the Bible. Let us use the Bible that's correct. Okay? Let's go forward. <clears throat> now, here is a calendar. And this is December 4 BC, before the common air. And what we're going to look at here is number 19, Tevet number 1. This is uh, the conception of the Messiah. And then, of course, you go on. you got the seventh day of Hanukkah. But uh, let, let me go on here because of time. We, therefore, need to determine when John, Yohakan, was born. Once we have that date, we can move six months into the future to determine the date of the Messiah's birth. So, do the scriptures give us any hints as to when John was born? As it turns out, there are many such hints in the passages describing the events leading up to John's birth. Therefore, <clears throat> determining the date of John's birth. One, John's father. We will look first to his father, Zechariah. Zechariah, number one, was a priest who served in the temple, Luke 1, verse 5. The promise is, if we can determine the timing of Zechariah's service in the temple when the angel announced that he was to have a son, then we should be able to follow the timing of events leading up to the birth of his son, John. Two, what is the course? A course is a week that the priest works inside the sanctuary. Okay, so when you read the word course in your Bibles, it means a week that you're determined to work inside the sanctuary of Ab Abaya. The eighth course of the priesthood, 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10. Note, the course of Ab Abaya, my father is Yah, see Psalms 68, verse 4, is the eighth course of the priesthood. Now, when the sanctuary was built and given to Moses, those priests would walk in here and they would be wearing white. And of course, John's father, or John's father, Zechariah, would walk into the sanctuary, into the holy place, and here's the most holy of holies. So as he would go into the holy place, his job was to make sure he had the incense burning. That was his job. But let me continue here. Uh, if we can determine one of the first course served, we can then determine when the eighth course served. Two, the priesthood. A, general. One, each course of the 24 courses of the priesthood served <clears throat> for a week at a time and transfer responsibility to the next course on the Sabbath day. The courses change duties on the Sabbath. Remember that, 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 8. After this 24-week period, the process would begin again. Thus, each course would serve two times per year, approximately six months apart, while this accounts for only 48 weeks of the year. The other four weeks are not forgotten. During the three major pilgrims' feasts, Passover and unleavened bread, which was the week of unleavened bread, seven days. And then uh, 30, 50 days later, you would come to Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. 90 days later, you come to the Feast of Tabernacles. All men were required to go to Jerusalem to present themselves before Jehovah. Unleavened bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. Three, because of the tremendous number of people in Jerusalem during the pilgrimage feast and the corresponding increase in the, number, <clears throat> in the number of sacrifices, the normal priestly courses were interrupted and all of the temple priests worked in the temple during those periods. In other words, during these feasts, the priest worked. All the priests served. They did not serve by course as they were given the duties by their leaders. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11. So all the priests served a week, a course, inside their duties that they were assigned to work. Okay? This was the job. Let's continue. Each priest, therefore, would perform temple duties on five different occasions in a given year. During both of the two weeks in each of his peculiar courses performed his duties. And during the three pilgrim feast days, <clears throat> when all uh, priests ser uh, served as shown below, Therefore, 24 courses times 2 equals 48 weeks. Plus 3 weeks would be 4 weeks. Appointed times is Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. So 48 and 4 is a total of 52 weeks equals 1 year. 1 year. 
And this was done every day. We now see that Gabriel, Gabriel the angel, could have visited Zechariah during one of five possible occasions, trying to figure which of five possible times would be a very difficult ta a task indeed. But the Bible narrows the field as for us considerably by giving us another very important detail in the book of Luke. In Zechariah, as uh, he was working as a priest, it's very important to notice what he was doing in the sanctuary. So when you have time, go back to the scriptures and read it again in prayer. Therefore, Zechariah was serving in the order of his course, Luke 1, verses 8 to 11. Note, we now know that Gabriel's appearance was not during one of the pilgrimage feasts when the priest did not wait by course. On the contrary, Gabriel appeared during one of the two regular weeks for the course of Abijah, when Zechariah performed his duties in the order of his course. Armed with these details, ladies and gentlemen, we should be able to determine the exact time of the year that Zechariah was in the temple. B, the beginning of the priesthood. Note, we know that the course of Abijah was the eighth course of the priesthood. 1 Chronicles 24.10 And as we have already seen, each priestly course served for a week at a time. Therefore, the course of Abijah would therefore be the eighth such course. But when was the yearly starting point, ladies and gentlemen? When was the point that started of the priestly courses? Once again, the Bible gives us the answers. And remember, the Bible gives us the answers, not books of a new order that are corrupt and compiled, okay? <clears throat> I, the Levitical priesthood did not come into being and begin to function before the tabernacle was set up, which is this tabernacle right here. <clears throat> so when was the tabernacle set up? On the first day of the first biblical month, Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, as we understand these key points, the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month, Nisan, of the biblical year. But how can that be? The Israelites had already lived through the Passover, which had happened on the 14th day of the first biblical month, Leviticus 23, verse 5. They had obviously, obviously, set up the tabernacle after this date. What is the problem? Exodus chapter 40, verse 17, none. It was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. The first month of the biblical calendar is the month of Nisan, Esther chapter 3, verse 7. Prior to the Babylonian exile, it was called Abib, Exodus 34, verse 18. Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, 3, <coughs> oops. Excuse me. After the tabernacle was set up and anointed, what happened next? Well, number 7, verses 4 through 10 reads, The princes of the twelve tribes were to bring offerings for dedication of the altar. On what day was the dedication of the altar completed? The twelfth day of the first biblical month, number 7, verses 11 to 78. The Bible is very explicit and very key point. With no intervening day, what happened on this day? <clears throat> The priests went through the anointing process and then began their service. Number 7, 78 through 8, verse 22. The biblical ecclesiastical calendar is cyclical, with all ordinances beginning on the same lunar date every year. The priestly service, therefore, would begin each year on the 12th day of the biblical month of Nisan. We must then determine the date on our Western calendar upon which the 12th of Nisan fell in the year that the angel visited Zechariah in the temple. Can I hear an amen? We will then be able to plot the beginning of the priestly service and calculate the dates of the service of the course of Abijah. From that point, it will be a fairly easy task to calculate the time of the conception of John the Baptist. Can I hear an amen? And divertively, the conception of, of the birth of our Savior, Yeshua. Determining the date of Aviv 12, Nisan 12, for the beginning of the priesthood. In determining the year of the birth of our Messiah, probably the most compelling work is a study entitled The Star, The Astonished the World by Ernest Martin, Ph.D. Dr. Martin does an excellent job of shifting through all the biblical and ex, uh, extra-biblical clues to determine that the year 3 BCE is the year of the birth of John the Baptist and of our Messiah. Their conceptions occurred in 4 BCE for reasons that will soon become evident. 
we must now examine the 12th day of the biblical month of Nisan in 4 BC. As the beginning of the priestly courses that year, before we continue our search, however, it might make it easier if we could uh, convert that date into the equivalent date on the calendar to which we are accustomed, the Gregorian calendar. The noted experts, Parker and Deberston. Therefore, Nisan 12, the day that marked the annual beginning of the priestly service, fell on April 9, 4 B.C. Calendar for April 4 B.C., you can see that. And uh, if you like some copies, I do have them. Determine the date of service for the eighth course of the priesthood. In Numbers 8, 22, it suggests that this beginning day of Nisan 12 was manned by all the priests rather than those of the first regular course. This makes perfect sense because two days later was Passover and seven days of unleavened bread, which began on Nisan 14. We must also remember that during the pilgrimage feast, such as Passover, the priests did not wait by course, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11. But all served due to the large number of sacrifices that had, be, that had to be offered. And in 4 BC, there was no intervening weekly Sabbath between Nisan 12 and Nisan 14. Therefore, the priests who were serving on Nisan 12 would also be serving on Nisan 14. Amen? First regular course of the priesthood would not have begun until the weekly Sabbath following the termination of Passover week. This Sabbath day was on April 21st, 4 B.C. And it was on this day that the first regular course of the priesthood would have begun its exclusive duty in the temple. The first course, ladies and gentlemen, would have terminated and been replaced by the second course on the Sabbath day, April 28th. The third course would then begin on the Sabbath day, May 5th. The fourth course would begin on May 12th. The fifth course would begin on May 19th. The sixth course would then begin on the Sabbath day, May 26th. The following week, the priestly courses would be interrupted by the second of the yearly pilgrimage feast. The appointed time was Shabbat, Pentecost. All the priests would therefore serve during the week of the 2nd to the 9th of June 4 B.C. And the regular courses would resume again with the 7th course on June 9th. The 8th course of Abijah, the course of Zechariah, would have begun on June 16 and terminated on June 23rd. Sometime during the week of 16th to the 23rd of June, the angel Gabriel appeared unto Zechariah, announced the birth of John, and struck Zechariah dumb for his unbelief. Mercy. The angel appeared while he was serving. Luke 1, verse 11 to 20. John's father's, or John's father journeys home. Date of departure from the temple, I. The Bible tells us that Zechariah did not depart the temple immediately, but waited until the days of his priestly duties were over. As soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed. I, one, since the duties of the course of Abijah terminated on the Sabbath, June 23rd, the earliest that Zechariah could have departed Jerusalem would have been Sunday, June 24, BC, 4 B.C. The Bible then gives us another clue by telling us that Zechariah departed to his own house while the exact location of his house is not specified. It is located in the hill country of Judah. Into the hill country, into a city of Judah, Luke 1, verse 39 and 40. Armed with this information, ladies and gentlemen, armed with this information, the exact city in which Zechariah can be inferred with a high degree of certainty, the book of Joshua lists the towns which had been given as a possession to the Levitical priesthood. The sons of Aaron, the only priestly city described as being located in the hill country of Judah, is Hebron in the hill country of Judah. So, while there are nine cities listed, only the city of Hebron is described as being in the hill country of Judah. Just as in Luke 1.39, Hebron therefore seems to be the most likely candidate for the location of the home of Zechariah. It is approximately 40 kilometers 24 miles from Jerusalem as shown below. So 24 miles, Zechariah would have to travel two to three days to get to the home from Jerusalem to Hebron. Now, knowing the location of his home, we must determine when he arrived there. 
We have already seen that Zechariah did not depart the temple as soon as he was struck dumb, but waited until after the termination of his, of his temple duties. Since the eighth course terminated on the Sabbath on the 23rd, June 4th, before Christ, the earliest date that Zechariah would have departed from Jerusalem for his own home or house would have been on Sunday, June 24. Because Zechariah was well stricken in years, Luke 1, 7, and most probably traveling on foot, the journey of approximately 40 kilometers from Jerusalem to Hebron would likely have taken two or three days. If he arrived at his house on June 26 and rested before sharing the angel's proclamation with his wife, the conception of John the Baptist would have occurred on or about Wednesday, June 27, 4 BC. Since the normal gestation period of the human baby is 40 weeks, 280 days, the birth of John would have been on or about April 3rd, 3 BC. The calendars at the appendix at the end of the study give a weekly progression of the gestation of John the Immerser. Therefore, as we look at this one, this is June 4 BC, we want to look at the 27th of Tammuz 2, which is probably the conception of John the Immerser. And so here you see what's, what has happened here on, on this chart. You can play the DVD back and, and get a closer view at it. <clears throat> Determine the date of Messiah's conception. The angel's announcement and Miriam's journey. A, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. I, as we noted at the beginning of the study, the Messiah was conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Can I hear an amen? Elizabeth hath also conceived. This is the sixth month with her. Luke 1, verse 34, 40. The first thing to notice is that the angel did not come to Miriam until it was the sixth month, ladies and gentlemen. That's something to uh, focus on of Elizabeth's pregnancy. This means that Miriam could not have been pregnant before that time. Notice also that Miriam did not hesitate to go to Elizabeth, but arose in those days and went with haste. These words were obviously given to show the reader that she began traveling in that same month in those days to see her cousin Elizabeth. Again, Miriam agreed to become the mother of Messiah in the presence of the angel. Isn't that a blessing? Be it unto me according to thy word, Luke 1, verse 38. And finally, we find that Miriam was already with child at the point of her arrival at the home of Elizabeth. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Notice that Elizabeth did not say, blessed will be the fruit of thy womb. She said, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, indicating that Miriam was already pregnant, ladies and gentlemen. Elizabeth further confirmed this fact when she called Miriam the mother of my Elohim, or Yehovah, indicating that she was presently the mother of the Messiah. These verses clearly show that the conception of our Messiah was six months after the conception of John the Baptist. Since John was conceived on or about the first day of the fourth month, now called Tammuz, the Messiah must have been conceived on or about the first day of the tenth month of Tevet. Can I hear an amen? amen. All you got to do is put it together, math and reading. And here's April uh, uh, 3 B.C., before the common air. Okay, so in the Gregorian calendar, April 3rd would have been on a Wednesday. And so here you see the processes. The first day of Tevet, the date of Messiah's conception. Note, as we can see, six months from the conception of John the Immerser, on the first day of the fourth month, six months later, brings us to the first day of the tenth, first of the tenth, first day of the tenth biblical month, Tevet. Does this make sense? Does it make sense? A. Just as the conception of Messiah was the first glimmer of hope for a lost world, the first day of the tenth month brought the first glimmer of hope for Noah and his family that they would again see dry land. It was on this day that the mountain tops first appeared above the flood waters. The tenth month, the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seen. In Jewish tradition, <clears throat> in Jewish tradition the first day of the tenth month seems to carry a particular significance. For example, among certain uh, Sephardic Hebrew communities, girls would gather on the seventh night of Hanukkah, which is Rosh Kadesh, Tevet, 
for a special holiday known as the girl's holiday or woman's Rosh Kadesh. One legend, for example, attributes this holiday to a Hebrew woman who at her own wedding ceremony motivated the restoration of the honor of the Hebrews, which had been brought to shame by the pagan influences of Hellenism. Likewise, Miriam's total submission to the will of the Almighty by agreeing to be the mother of the Messiah displayed courage similar to the legendary actions above. And indeed, the Feast of Hanukkah derives from the rededication of the temple after the abominable sacrificing of a swine upon the altar of the Hellenists under direction of Antiochus Epiphanes. And in a sense, the Almighty himself performed a rededication of human temple when he, by means of his Holy Spirit, implanted into Miriam's womb the Savior of the world on the first day of the tenth month, Test of the theory of the first Tevet conception, ladies and gentlemen. Note, we will now test the assumption that Messiah's conception occurred on the eve of the first day of the 10th month. If we count 40 weeks forward from that day, we come to the first day of the appointed time of tabernacles. September 25th, 3 BC. According to the accompanying calendars, a curious overlooked clue in the New Testament. The book of John contains an interesting clue. In John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Note the word dwelt in this passage is the, is the Greek word, which means to dwell in a temporary dwelling or to tabernacle. And so I put up a few uh, key points here in the Greek. Will of man, but of God were born, and the word flesh became and tabernacled among us, and we held the glory. This is in Greek. And here's your reference as that you can continue your studies. <clears throat> Note, a rela uh, related indication that the passage of jo in John 1.14 is referring to the appointed time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles can be found if we look to the Septuagint rendering of Leviticus 23, verse 42. In this verse, which explains that the children of Israel are to dwell in tabernacles during the Feast of Tabernacles, the same Greek word, is used that we find in 1 John 14. The Septuagint from the Latin word, meaning 70, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The name derives from the tradition that the translation was done by 70 Jewish scholars at Alexandria, Egypt, during the reign of Ptolemy Philadelphus, 285-247. Note, one of the most significant New Testament clue is found in chapter 2 of the book of Luke, which seemingly small detail is mentioned three times in the passage. In Luke 2, verse 7 and 16, and here come some keys. The Messiah was lying in a manger, and your key there is was lying in a trough. It's a trough that animals come in and eat out of. The manger is not the building that we have been assuming. It is the trough that they would see him. Let's continue. The usual comments on these verses center around the humble manner in which the Savior of the world made his entrance into human history. If we look closely at verse 12, however, we see a strong indication that the Messiah's lying in a manger was more than simply an indication of his humble entrance into the world. This shall be a sign. Look at this. This shall be a sign troth unto us, unto you. Luke 2, verse 12. <clears throat> Note, the fact that the shepherds were to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes was nothing out of the ordinary because new babies are usually wrapped in some type of swaddling clothes following their birth. Therefore, the fact that this newborn infant would be lying in a manger, troth, was somehow to be a significant sign to them. But just what was the writer of the book of Luke trying to tell us? Here. The message is pretty, pretty uh, exciting. One and pinpoints the, uh, the birth of the Messiah exactly to the appointed time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Can I hear an amen? That's why the feasts were given to us, ladies and gentlemen. You as Christians and Seventh-day Adventists and Catholics, you have all dumbed down this whole information. And listen to me. The Bible is very clear. Very clear. We will begin by looking at the focus of this, of this sign, the manger, the Greek word according to Dr. Strong's in 5336. Okay, so there's the crib, manger. Note, a manger is a box. 
in which feet for horses or cattle is placed. And it was indeed such a trough in which the Messiah was laid. Poor Messiah. But why would this be a sign unto Jewish shepherds of the arrival of their Messiah or the world? The sign to the shepherds. While we have all been taught that the revelation of the Savior's birth was made to shepherds because they were lowly or humble, that they may not be the case. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David were all shepherds. A group of little old cleaning ladies might have been a much more humble uh, example, and a small group of orphans would certainly have been more lowly. Hebrew shepherds were chosen for a very specific reason. Of all people, they were the most familiar with the practices associated with domestic farm animals. This is a key point, as we will now see. In the book of Genesis, we find the following passage in Genesis 33, verse 37, verse 17. Jacob made booths for his cattle, therefore the place is called Succoth. The Bible tells us here that the place uh, Jacob settled, Succoth, was given its name because of the settlers or booths he built for his domestic animals. And so here in, in the Greek is the same reading. And Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible defines the Hebrew word for these shelters as Sakuth. Notice that Sakuth is the plural of Strong's 5521, which is described as follows. Sakuth, the name of a place in Egypt, and three in plural, Sakuth. So the word Sakuka was used in biblical times in Palestine to describe the type of shelter, shelters built for cattle, and similar domestic livestock. And it was in such a sukkah that feeding troughs, mangers, were to be found. So when the shepherds went to look for the newly born king, Yeshua, of the world, lying in a manger, they would have been looking for him in a sukkah, trough. That's the key. The sign is the trough. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> With this important piece of information, we can now look back to Leviticus to see how a baby lying in a manger inside a sukkah was to be a sign to the Hebrew shepherds. Speaking of the appointed time of tabernacles, three times the Almighty instructed His people to dwell in booths, sukkah, for seven days. Leviticus 23, verse 41, 43. It's still binding today, ladies and gentlemen. It's His birthday on tabernacles in which He returns on his birthday, in his second advent. Can I hear an amen? amen? Yeshua's coming back the second time on his birthday. He's coming back in the Feast of Tabernacles. We should be excited. We should be celebrating because we know when he's coming back. And no one knows the day and the hour? No one knows the day and the hour? Yeshua is asking, why are you keeping the wrong day, ladies and gentlemen? Every year keeping the wrong day of his birth, celebrating a pagan feast. And who changed the day for my birth? Is this why the appointed times were given to protect us from the evil one? But why would the birth of a baby in a sukkah somehow be a significant sign to Hebrew shepherds? If we look to the book of Zechariah, for example, we see that the appointed time of Saku is the appointed time that represents that feast is associated with the Messiah dwelling in the earth. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. The fact that the shepherds were to find a newborn baby lying in a manger in a sukkah on the first day of the appointed time of sukkah was a sign to them that their Messiah, our Messiah, had come into the world. This will become even more clear as we look deeper into the meaning of this appointed time. Shimini Azaret. That's when he's coming. Shimini Azaret. The appointed time of sukkah tabernacles. Note. After the Israelites moved into the land of Palestine, it was during this particular appointed time that the Israelites were to leave the comfort of their normal dwellings and to move into a temporary dwelling under the stars. They were to remember that they, although they were in the world, they were not of the world. This dwelling in temporary tabernacles was to remind them that they were sojourners in a world of sin dependent upon their Elohim that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths. But notice what frame of mind was to characterize the act of leaving the comfort and convenience of permanent, permanent earthly dwellings and to go out with the bugs and snakes. Many of us don't like to do that. Ye shall rejoice before 
Yehovah, your Elohim, seven days, Leviticus 23, 40. Note, this week of dwelling in a sukkah was not to be a time of sorrow. Oh, no. On the contrary, it was to be a time of great rejoicing. As a matter of fact, it is the only of the appointed times of Elohim where rejoicing was what? Mandatory. But why? Why was it mandatory? This Old Testament directive was doing more than simply mandating that the participants were to have fun during the feast, as we have seen. But unbeknownst to most of the Israelites of that day, observance of this particular appointed time foreshadowed the birth of the Savior of the world. And this event was to give the world a true reason to be joyful. This joy was later announced by the angels as they announced to the shepherds the birth of their Savior. I bring you glad tidings, or good tidings, of great joy, which shall be to all people. Luke 2, verse 10 and 11. The appointed time of tabernacles is the very embodiment of the, precise, of the presence of the Messiah. Not only did he leave the comfort and convenience of his glory, of his heavenly abode, to come to earth and dwell in temporary earthly sukkah, but his future millennial reign will also be signified by this appointed time. Can I hear an amen? amen. To worship the king, Yehovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles, Zechariah 14, verse 16. And the appointed time of tabernacles will be relevant at, even after the millennial reign when the earth and heavens are created anew without the presence of sin and death. Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men and he will dwell with them. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. We see again that the dwelling of Elohim and his Messiah with man is typified. By the Jehovah's appointed time of tabernacles, this appointed time, therefore, is not simply for Jews, but for all the children of the Almighty from the beginning of time to the end of time, and in the new earth and the new heavens. Okay? We're going to keep it as well. Our Father tells us in Leviticus 23, verse 41, that this feast shall be a statute forever. For what? Forever in your generations. He did not tell us to keep it until the coming of the Messiah and then to do away with it, as many of us have been taught. And if we obey our Heavenly Father, we will be celebrating the actual biblical birth of our Savior. But why an eighth-day festival? Why? The first day shall be a Sabbath, it's a Sabbath. It's not the weekly Sabbath, it's a Sabbath. And on the eighth day is a Sabbath. Leviticus 23, verse 39. Notice that the seven-day feast is bracketed by a Sabbath. And on the first day, on the eighth day, what the English word Sabbath does not accurately convey, ladies and gentlemen, however, is the nature of these two words, Sabbaths. The regular Hebrew word for Sabbath is Shabbat. Shabbat. This word means a day of rest and is defined by Strong's as follows. 7676 TBV, Shabbat. Okay? Shabbat. Intermission, etc. Specifically, Sabbath, every Sabbath. The Hebrew word used for Sabbath in the above verse is not TBV, Shabbat. Strong 7676. It is rather Sabbaton. Sabbaton and is defined by Strong's as follows. 76, 77, Sabbaton. 76, 76, Sabbatism, or special holy day, rest, Sabbath. So you've got word number 76, 77, or 76, 76. A Sabbaton is a special Sabbath that carries a particular significance. As New Testament believers, we can easily see why our Creator would designate the first day of Sukkah, the birthday of the Savior of the world. Can I hear an amen? As a truly special day, a Sabbaton. But why is the eighth day of the appointed time of tabernacles also a special Sabbath? A Sabbaton. Five, like every other Hebrew male child, the eighth day of Yeshua's life was an extremely special day on which he was brought into the covenant promise. There's the key covenant that I've been speaking of centuries earlier to his father Abraham. This is my covenant which you shall keep. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. Genesis 17, verse 7 to 11. The New Testament tells us that Yeshua 
was in fact circumcised and named on the eighth day of tabernacles, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called what? Yahushua. On the eighth day of Feast of Tabernacles, his name was Yeshua, and he was sick, uh, circumcised, and he kept that covenant from that point on until his death. Can I hear an amen? I mean, I'm excited about it because the Bible's telling us the truth. The fact that Yeshua was circumcised and received his name on the eighth day, we should say amen on this, of the appointed time of Sukkah is no coincidence. After all, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And everything that happened to him was done to fulfill the scriptures, the prophets, and the apostles wrote. And in Adventist home, they were telling us that we don't know when he was born, that it's silent. Who is lying to who, ladies and gentlemen? Who is lying to who? It is widely recognized in mainstream Christian circles that our Messiah was able to be the perfect offering for our sins because he was able to keep the commandments of the law, referring to the Torah, perfectly Messiah's name, Yeshua, means Yahuwah will save. So in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it, the definition in the King James Bible is there. He shall save his people. Yeshua shall save his people. Can I hear an amen? And proclaims that he is our Savior sent by his Father, Yahuwah. Technically speaking, Messiah could not begin to be our Savior until he came into the covenant and began to keep the law perfectly on our behalf. As Paul stated, we have not an high priest which was in all points tempted yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of Elohim in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Whom Elohim has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Romans 3, verse 23 to 25. We see then the reason that Messiah's circumcision was so important to the world is that until his circumcision and his entry into the covenant relationship that had been passed down from Abraham, we could have and hope of being saved. And the eighth day of the appointed time of Sukkot is a beautiful picture of that salvation. Therefore, after seven days, we leave our seven days of wilderness walking in the Sukkah. And on the eighth day, we come back into the comfortable living of our homes. Yeshua, the very fulfillment of every promise and prophecy of the Torah, brings us back home, a picture of glorious inheritance of our heavenly home. Now, September 3rd. On Tishri the 15th, the Messiah's birth takes place, first day of tabernacles. And then on the eighth day of tabernacles is when he was circumcised, which is the Sabbath as well. So the eighth day of the appointed time of Sukkot, the day on which Messiah formally announced his status as Savior of the world through his circumcision and naming, is truly a day worthy of being established as a Sabbaton and a day of mandatory rejoicing by our Creator. Shimon Yazaretis when he returns. Ladies and gentlemen, there are the facts. The 25th day of December is a pagan holiday, which is part of the mark of the beast. Stay away from all this abomination, okay? You got the scriptures, a little bit of spirit of prophecy, but remember, we know that Ellen White didn't write that in here because it contradicts what she did write in the other feast. Therefore, there are many uh, references. The word law in this case is used to describe the law of Moses, which is enumerated in the first five books of the Bible. These first five books are known to most Christians by the Greek word Pentateuch. In the Hebrew, it's Torah. The original Hebrew word for the law, however, is Torah. It is this term that will be used from here on. And so these end notes will help us uh, somewhat. So when, and I just want to rebuttal here. Uh, the argument that has been placed is that uh, no one knew of the birth of the Messiah. That's a big lie. And since I was a little boy growing up, sure, my mother would go and cut the tree down, etc. It was exciting. It was nice. We're given presents. Maybe sometimes we didn't get no presents. A little tear here and there. But I got to finding out, as many other peoples with other denominations and so forth, that everybody was involved in celebrating that. But the only ones that weren't were the ones who were biblically not scholarly, but biblically aware that 
it was not the birth of the Messiah. So for the last few years, I, I've been going through this study with many others and many other Jewish friends. And so I want to give credit to them because they were taught from their fathers and their generations. And as we come into the, the arena of, of a nice, good season, which is a paganism season, do not let the devil humble you into that season, but keep your eyes fixed on Yeshua because he's coming back and he's looking for souls that he can teach and train and prepare for a second coming. So let us uh, close. And for me, I will kneel. For those who would like to kneel, I'd like to invite you to uh, kneel with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to come to you and thank you, Yeshua, for revealing to us when you were born and how beautiful the Bible is exalting your holy name. And blessed be your holy name, Yeshua. We await your coming and prepare a people and empower us for we ask for the baptism of your Holy Spirit afresh upon us. And we thank you for hearing us in our prayers. Hallelujah.